everyone, welcome to episode 190 of the Bite That Weekly Wrestling Podcast, available every single Wednesday night, where we break down the latest happenings inside of the WWE, and this week, it's all about the superstar shakeup. It's all about the situation happening between JBL and Mauro Ranallo, the unfortunate situation with Finn Balor. Finn Balor comes back, has his first singles match, and is currently out with a concussion because gender hindered the demon. Doesn't rhyme. I thought it would, but we're just going to go on with it. So remember that you can check out the podcast on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, vid.me slash bite that. Help us out by dropping a five-star review on any of the above. Plus, you can support us directly by going over to patreon.com slash bite that for as little as $1 a month. You get access to a raw, uncut video version of the show, which includes also an additional Patreon-exclusive pre-show where Keith, he's back. So spoilers, Keith is here right now. Hey, And we talk a little bit about his travels and uh, some some Mountain Dew, was it, that we talked about, Keith? Was it Uh, Mountain Dew? Rockstar. Rockstar, close enough. So my name is Juan Velas. I am from San Juan, Puerto Rico. I don't drink soft drinks. I haven't had any in like eight years. But Keith Poshuk from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, clearly has... We also got Ryan McNulty from Boston, Mass. Ryan, you didn't go to SmackDown this week. No, you know, I I had an option to, and this was like a pretty important SmackDown, but I had quite a lot of live wrestling in my life recently. Never enough wrestling, Super don't blame you. So I decided, you know what? I'll, I'll let everyone else have the fun. I'm just going to watch it at home. I've seen more wrestling live than I have on TV recently, so it's time to, to go back to the old TV. And we're going to be talking about a lot of wrestling, but before we do, I do want to give a shout out to our brand new Patreon, Dominic Diaz, as well as Paul Loban, Tony Meyer, and Ashley Hudson. Gold patrons, thank you. We're just around the corner, by the way, from a second Patreon goal, which if you're listening to us on the road... How about you want some of those YouTube videos on the go in audio? We're going to be doing that. We're going to be launching a second podcast feed once we reach that. So the first topic is going to be the Superstar Shakeup. So this week, we change things a little bit with our poll that we do every week over at twitter.com slash bite that cast, where instead of asking about the enjoyment from Raw or SmackDown, the question was, which show are you most excited for based on the shakeup? Raw or SmackDown, not surprising given the the path that we always get. 75% of people voted SmackDown Live, only 25% Raw, so it was very, very one-sided. So before we get to like these specific people that got switched, we didn't know what this format was going to be, right? Like I was thinking it was going to be like the draft where opposite sides... Uh, you know, I'm going to say who I want. You're going to say who I, who you want. But then it's interesting how they did it. So on Raw, we got the people that were moving to Raw. And then on SmackDown, we got the same type of situation. Did you think they took advantage or made the best out of that type of format? Uh, very much so. I uh, I like this better than, oh, the two GMs go on the stage because it creates these like cool little moments. The uh, In my mind, the gold star example is the Bray Wyatt Finn Balor moment where if you had the GMs on stage saying, I draft Bray Wyatt, you'd never get something like that. But it was uh, it was awesome uh, for or from that format. So I think it's a huge improvement and I hope they do that going forward. I thought it was smart that they were able to find an effective way to do this over two shows. So you wanted to tune into both to see where everyone went. They didn't just do the full draft on Raw. The issue I have with it is that I would have liked to see a little bit more of like story explanation about the process. Like who if you watch Talking Smack, you'll see Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan are kind of just joking around that they basically didn't even know who was making these picks. You could tell they had no idea what, like, the kayfabe draft process actually was. Who's behind all this? Yeah, exactly. Nobody knows. So I think they could have done what Keith wanted to do, which is you can kind of have people just pop up, but they also could have just explained the process of, okay, Raw, they get to make their picks from SmackDown tonight, And maybe there's some sort of limitations, like they can't take certain things, like you can't pick the SmackDown tag champs because 
they stay on SmackDown or something. Just some set of rules I thought would have been nice, but it's kind of just classic Vince McMahon. I'm just going to do what's convenient and just not explain it. But before talking smack, they did kind of um, like they didn't like directly say it, but they would bring up mentions like, oh, the GMs are working together to come up with these trades. And then it kind of all got thrown out the window. But, and talking and it, because but they never smack, really. They yeah, just poke fun at that. And it's weird because do they ever like line up who was traded for who? They at the beginning they explained it. They like Sami Zayn. He uh, Kurt Angle was talking to Sami Zayn about like a trade or something, right? But they never actually were like, oh, this person was traded for this person. And I understand you couldn't reveal both names on Raw and then give away who is you know who's going to SmackDown. So it was just a little awkward. Well, the thing is, let's be real. When you look at the breakdown, you can tell, like, and I like how you really set this based on a tier system where it's not like anybody was going to go, and I'm going to draft to Raw Kurt Hawkins and the crowd explodes. That wasn't going to happen. So I guess this was their way of just, we got to do a little bit of everybody. We got to switch things up a bit. So we'll just do it. Get it out of the way. Logic's not really there because even on Talking Smack, when Shane McMahon was talking about it, he mentioned the big names. And at the end, it's like, oh, Shining Stars and Kurt Hawkins. Yeah, like he had to shoehorn those guys in there a little bit because otherwise it just seems so obvious that they they wanted to focus on the big names. But overall, I got to say, I had a, a really good fun time uh, watching this, especially on SmackDown. I will say on Raw. I didn't like how the show started. Like, it just felt like a normal show. Like, sure, right off the bat, we got to see some of the people that were going to be switching. But throughout the night, and this is always the issue with a three-hour show, it just became, well, just show us the next person. Because you're not seeing the GMs interact. You're not seeing Dana Bryan backstage at Raw saying, oh, damn, you got this guy. Well, I'm going to get this guy. So you, you just have to wait for Bray Wyatt to come out. You have to wait for, apparently... Elias Sampson getting called up, which was a rumor that he, he was going to be called up, and he was. He just walked off, but even then, it's like, how <laughs> do you shake be things up like that? Yeah, the drift. The drifter is real, man. He just walked up there. So um, how how about we then go to Raw first and see what Raw got to uh, take a bite out of SmackDown Live? Let's do it. So first up, not too great. I was very sad about this. Byron Saxton and David Otunga are being traded. So beginning next week, we get David Otunga on Raw. I yeah. can't yeah. figure out what I could say about uh, that. Well, one thing we'll I want to know Byron Saxton on SmackDown. Before we we'll like, get those hot Rikishi scoops on Mondays yeah. or Monday nights now. I just want to say before we jump into things, at the end, once we go over everything, uh, we should do our favorite move in our least favorite move shining stars what <laughs> um yeah the well, end. with otunga i am super happy about this move for one reason only and that is to get byron saxton away from bailey uh just be on the opposite Barry side yeah I, so i never Yay! have to hear that I'll, i'm like all for yeah i'm all for a change up i think uh I think Corey Graves might be able to help uh, David Otunga along so that maybe he might say something interesting. Even Corey has limits. Yeah, because let's put it this way. If we got Corey crapping on David Otunga now instead of Byron Saxton, maybe that'll give Otunga something to say. Like he he can start to try and come back or something. Maybe some banter can be created there because Otunga just kind of was there on SmackDown. And much like you out there in listener land, I just discovered that Ryan hates fun with Byron Saxton and the Bailey Buddy. Is that fun? Is that fun? I like Byron Saxton. I really do. That's just the one thing I could not stand. So just keep Ah, Bailey and Saxton as far away from each other and I'm good. It's fine. So how are you guys feeling about Elias Samson? I mean... He was a guy in NXT that the crowd wasn't really loving. He had the one match stint as El Vagabundo, which we got to see at a TakeOver before TakeOver actually happened. Not a lot Is to say about this guy. Is that going to air on anything or is that just like a, no, a that dark was, that match? Was on, yeah, that, that, was, that was showcased. That was, that was featured. So that was a one-time thing. And then he moved up, which is super weird how you got fired. 
you know, quote unquote, then you get to have this mask and then you're on Raw. So yeah, it was a little bad. strange that this was a part of the superstar shakeup. We kind of had two picks that were just like thin air picks where they weren't really being taken from anywhere. They just kind of showed up. I guess that's part I, of a shake on a shake up. Anything can happen, Magal. Yeah, uh, I didn't yeah, really cool. uh, I didn't really incorporate this to the superstar shakeup because his whole thing is the drifter, right? Like to me, he just kind of showed up he, on he Raw. I was, I was expecting way. him to sh- I was expecting him to show up on SmackDown and it might still happen this or next week. You never know because he's just drifting. Drifter's going to drift. So then talking about the lower card. We have Kalisto and Kurt Hawkins. So I'm just going to start by saying I assume what's going to happen with Kalisto is that he's going to have to work Mondays and he's going to have to uh, work uh, Tuesdays when I guess he's going to be added to the Cruiserweight division. The whole division he should have been part of since day one. He's just going to do that. So he's going to be everywhere is what I assume is going to happen. And then Kurt Hawkins is like in this tricky spot where from the moment that he came back, he was just squashed and squashed. And the man does have some talent, but at this point, is this salvageable? I don't think so. Any thoughts about these two guys? I'm happy that Kalisto is on Raw now. Like you said, it made, one would have thought it made perfect sense for Kalisto to be, basically be what Neville is right now, to be the guy to head the cruiserweight division. But now I kind of like that he's entering it a little bit later after it's kind of found its footing a little bit so he can eventually feud with Neville and Austin Aries. And he's got a ton of new people that he hasn't worked with like on 205 Live. So that that's a good move. Kurt Hawkins, yeah, they basically turned him into a jobber right from the get-go. Granted, that's you what they... the facts. Yeah, that's what they did with Jinder Mahal and it seems like they might be trying to do a little bit more with him now. But that you know, if I'm if I'm talking about Kurt Hawkins hoping to become a Jinder Mahal, we're already in a really bad Ooh, place. Oh, brother! Yeah. <laughs> but so yeah, I moving think... up. Oh, oh okay. okay. Wait, you, okay. You, wait. You got something to say about this? Yeah, no, I was gonna say it's not even against you. It's just yeah, fair. sad stuff. I was just gonna make a little joke of um, it doesn't really matter if it's Monday or Tuesday. Kalisto will do lucha things. That is very true, man. Yeah. That is an excellent observation. So thanks for raining on my joke. <laughs> Sorry, man. So Apollo Cruz, he was the first man, and, and I love this, and no offense to Apollo Cruz, but you know how you, you show that you're going to shake things up a bit? The first person you reveal to be changing brands is Apollo Cruz. I, I made this very passionate uh, video that's currently up on the Instagram. Bite that. So check that out for my, my initial reaction. Paul Cruz, what's up? I don't know. I feel like this could be the dark horse of the whole superstar shakeup because Apollo wasn't really doing much on SmackDown. And it might not be overnight, but maybe he could do something on Raw because, I mean, he does have a really good mid card to work there with people like Samoa Joe. Um, spoilers, probably Kevin Owens, in my opinion. And uh, just like going into well, that uh, Kevin Owens may have... Uh may have wait did you apollo cruz and kevin Owens? they're not on the same show anymore well whoa, not whoa, right whoa. now remember, yeah but the they will be thing. they will be remember but, kevin right, owens well, not, is I not on smackdown yeah, yeah. kevin okay. owens is not on smackdown the u.s champion is currently on smackdown and mm-hmm. so but uh, there's we'll get to that but yeah we'll yeah, get it's to gonna that. be very confusing but so then moving up but we because we probably got more things to cover here i, will, so right, I can't right talk about apollo cruz See? Then talk about Apollo Crews then. Talk about Apollo Crews. What about Apollo Crews? Welcome I, to my world. I, yeah, I'm not I'm not really a fan of this, at least for Crews, because I feel like SmackDown was the right place for a guy in his position. Whereas Raw is it's way too easy to get lost in the shuffle in Raw. And I really don't have a lot of hope for Crews on, on Raw at all. So uh, I was kind of sad about this one. With the tag team scene, this was such a weird thing. The tag team, the, the tag team that we thought was going to end is now on Raw, which is Slater and Rhino. Is this like just the next Enzo and Cass? Because like the rumor was that Enzo and Cass maybe would go to SmackDown and then they would feel like that comedy type tag team route. But now we have both of this type of tag team on Raw. Does that help the tag division? 
I'm shocked there wasn't more shakeup in the tag division because the Raw tag division just seems like a mess right now where there's so many teams and you they barely get any time anyway. So how do you manage that? But even though they came over as a team, that doesn't mean they'll be a team for very long. So I think that like Slade and Rhino are just going to probably still break up sometime soon. Yeah, I agree. I don't think there was nearly enough change for the tag division. Also, are I guess the club and the revival are the only heel tag teams right now on Raw that you kind of got a lot of company now with um, Enzo and Cass, the Hardys, Sheamus and Cesaro. You got like three big face tag teams. It's going to be tough to really have that all line up and have everybody doing something relevant. So uh, I'm surprised they didn't move another face team over to SmackDown. So then about the women's division, on Raw, we got three, even though two of them are are really labeled as the athletes. And it is Alexa Bliss, Mickey James, and Maurice. Now, Alexa Bliss, we kind of talked about. Like, that's probably one of the people. She's been involved in every championship scenario on SmackDown Live, so it makes sense that you freshen things up a little bit by moving her Now, Mickey James, I think, is interesting, where Mickey James came in as part of the Alexa Bliss storyline, so it seems odd that they would still, like, keep them blended together. And then the third person is being Marie, so, like, we'll get to her when we talk about The Miz. So, given that we got to bring this up, because, like, Tamina doesn't really count, but Charlotte, it was a huge part of Raw. She was the part of Raw. So, do you think that Raw can get can get a little bit of that rejuvenation from the women's division by removing Charlotte and then inserting James and Bliss. Yeah, Rob Pro, Ron needed more help in the women's division not because it wasn't good but just because it was way more stale than what was going on on SmackDown. So it makes sense why they moved two bigger names over to Raw. And I think this really shakes things up because Charlotte really did pretty much feud with everybody. So it was time for her to kind of step out and let uh, Alexa Bliss, someone who really established herself on on SmackDown. And just Alexa Bliss on Raw just feels really fresh, like really different. And it, it's just a whole new cast of people. They needed to separate Sasha and Charlotte. That's for sure. I agree, because by separating the two, you level out the playing field on the Raw women's division, where it's not just towered over by, like, uh, Charlotte and Sasha, and then everything else just kind of happens around it. Now you have this level playing field where really anybody can be champion once again, and it's, uh, it, it adds new light. It's more in line with SmackDown. Exactly. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering what they're going to do with Mickey James cuz I don't see her becoming champion on Raw. I still don't really get like what is Mickey James in 2017 because she does see feel like the an Dudley person boys. in this. Cuz that's probably yeah. what it's going to be like. Plus, I mean the fact that she's on Raw, it almost seems like she's going to be there exclusively to be the stepping stone. Like we we talked about how Bailey, Charlotte, Sasha, Nia, they've all defeated each other. There's never been just that one person on the Raw side because Alicia Fox, Fox, is not even wrestling right now. So I guess like you have Mickey James just taking the pin for everybody. And then maybe that's that's what freshened things uh, up a little bit. So then when it comes to the main event scene or everything around it, we got The Miz, Dean Ambrose as the Intercontinental Champion, and then we got Bray Wyatt. So Bray Wyatt, it does seem like maybe, <laughs> I mean, this is tough because like, Finn Balor's basically out of action right now, thanks to Jinder Mahal, of all people. But that seemed to be where they were going to be going. Which of these three guys do you think has, now not so much that you're excited about, but that you see potential for from a storyline main event standpoint? Like Finn Balor's up here, Rollins is somewhere up here, Brock Lesnar's nowhere to be found right now. Who's just below these guys, between these three? Of the three, honestly, it's probably Dean Ambrose because honestly, but 
I'm I'm worried about this is the part of the shakeup that I'm worried about the most of will these people get lost in the clutter because the Miz had a fantastic year. Will that translate to Monday nights? I hope so, but I'm not hopeful. Bray Wyatt looks like he's going to be Bray Wyatt probably pretty soon and just get obliterated by Finn once he's uh once he's healthy, but Dean Ambrose, he might have the shot because with this shakeup all three members of the Shield are on the same uh on the I same don't show know why again. They did that. So now by one of them feuding for the title, we all know which one that's going to be. It brings up the other two with him to go back to that well. So Dean probably yep. has the most realistic shot. I agree. Although I feel like Dean is just going to kind of be the anchor for the upper mid card division with the intercontinental title. I feel like Bray is going to just find himself in the position he kind of usually finds himself in, save for most of last year, which is he's going to feud with all the bigger guys and he's going to lose a lot. And I feel like he's going to fall right back into that. The Miz, and I'll say it right now, this is my least favorite move in the entire uh, shakeup. The Miz going to Raw is going to kind of throw, like, he may still be doing excellent work, but he's going to get thrown into where he was before the draft of just kind of being in the mid card because a utility player. Yeah. uh, SmackDown was really a great chance for him to possibly get that second run with the WWE championship. And now when you go to raw, where there's a lot of people that you have to jump in line to get to that universal title, his chances look uh, just a lot worse for another big run, something I think he really deserves after how tremendous and entertaining Absolutely. his work has been lately. So yeah, it just felt like he was on the gra- like on the cusp of just completing an amazing run and they move him over to raw where he he probably will get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate for me between these three. The Miz is the one that I see the most potential. But as you mentioned, it's like right now, look at who the champion is, Brock Lesnar. So for the Miz to become a championship contender, Brock Lesnar would have to lose the championship. Insert a lot of laughter between this right now because that's not going to be happening for a couple of months. So we're looking at if then like a Survivor Series championship win from the Miz, unless he turns babyface, unless he becomes a good guy, which he shouldn't. And like the biggest factor where we didn't even really think about this too much, I'm going to miss the Miz on Talking Smack. Like we gained Kevin Owens on Talking Smack, but There's there was something about talk. that show. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Oh, I cannot wait for that. But he'll prob- they'll probably make him like a host of Raw Talk. He'll, he'll get relegated to something like that. With any luck, that may be what happens. With Dean Ambrose, man... Like Ryan sort of commented, I'm surprised that they have Rollins, Reigns, and Ambrose because I feel they're going to do the crowd control thing. Reigns is not getting cheered. Hey, I got two of my buddies who the happen to be good back. guys right now. Yeah, the Shield is back, man. And All like, three members of the Shield are technically babyface right now. And don't forget, yeah. like Triple H is currently out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, they're labeled that part. And then don't forget, Triple H may be out of action. He's going to be back. And Samoa Joe is still on Raw. So they just need that one guy. They need that one supporter to then have a, to have a thing going on. It could be Braun Strowman. Because, I mean, Braun Strowman destroyed Roman Reigns. Like, Holy that's not shit. even part of this week's uh, agenda. I was going to say, okay, how was that? I, I just realized I completely omitted that from the agenda. Damn. That Maybe was hilarious and awesome. the best segment on Monday Night Raw in years. It was so good. At what he just point kept coming think- back. I thought I really wanted <laughs> to, sorry to keep going to this, but I really wanted him to be the driver of that second ambulance. <laughs> that would have right. been, that would have been icing on he the just cake. Kept going and yeah. going. And so I was saying like, he should have done the, uh, like the, he should have been like the doctor, like Steve Austin was at the hospital. Just They're still next so- week. Yeah. Somehow people <laughs> buy that. There's this giant guy who is a doctor. I don't think they've ever tried so hard to make a guy look like a bad guy. Like Roman Reigns was punched in the ambulance, like helpless. He could not defend himself. So it was hilarious. This giant beast of a man just punching the guy that's tied up 
It was there, you then... deserve a chance going on yeah, too. Yeah, man. I'm <laughs> so okay. I'm so proud of that ironic you deserve a chant. Normally I hate that chant, but that that Whoa. is how that is the Whoa. new meta for you deserve a chance. I can get behind this meta. So the one thing we need to bring up is the ambulance itself. When it started to happen, when you saw Braun Strowman grab it, what did you think? Um, I started doing JR voices in my head, like, don't do it, Ron! Don't do it! Oh, God! Oh, God! And I was just impressed, and it was fan freaking tastic. Because he totally did that by himself, no support at all. 100% yeah. confirmed. Yeah. Dave exactly. and, that's, and that's live television. Like, usually stuff like that happens on SmackDown, where they can... Well, they can pre-tape... They, backstage and they clearly did with certain segments yeah, that's that's true that's you true. know it's when the camera conveniently like got all fuzzy at certain points because it definitely you wasn't see roman two reigns get out you could literally see roman reigns's shadow on the I left side that. of the screen i didn't i, I didn't, didn't, I didn't look initially. that deep i but, am 100 percent suspending yeah, my even, disbelief with that bs <laughs> even when he like flipped the stretcher thing over the edge like it fell you, face first yeah, but I'm died. saying you could see like the screen crept out for a second because it was clearly two different takes, one with Roman in the stretcher, one with him not. Because you're not going to throw him off a loading dock with like strapped to a stretcher. So, but yeah, I mean, Braun I would be surprised. Either way, I thought it was really cool. I, I so had good. to laugh at just <clears throat> how like full cartoon they went with him just tipping over an ambulance. But you know what? It's it's wrestling and there's a lot of dumb stuff. And we got Bray Wyatt, you know, doing magical things and blowing up TVs and stuff, then I think we can cameramen. we can do yeah. I think we can we can deal with this. So then let's get to talking about SmackDown Live. So we have Jinder at the bottom here with Sin Cara. I kinda feel like with what happened with Finn Balor, which should we bring that up now? I mean, we we kinda brought up Finn Balor. So reactions like the moment that happened in the match, like it was like a forearm where Jinder Mahal hit him and you saw Finn fall hard and props to Finn, like yet another match where he's injured in the middle of it, still manages to kind of hit the Pele kick, hit the, uh, the, uh, coup de gras and all that stuff while under a concussion, you could see his face, like his, his face was all red. Everything. Yeah, you could see the I, red I was getting marks. Eva Marie oh, vibes. Yeah. oh my God. I mean, Thoughts these guys that. do these guys wrestle so much and are such professionals that even when something like that happens, they can kind of just go on autopilot and somehow like you'll always hear like you'll hear Daniel Bryan say like he doesn't even know like that how he finished the match, like doesn't remember. But like you go back and watch him and he's doing everything perfectly. These guys do this a lot. They know what they're doing. So even under a, a heavy concussion they could still just pull everything off pretty pretty crazy uh they, like a lot of people are, are getting all over gender for this um just because he he did stiff the hell out of balor with that but i mean stuff like this happens it's wrestling you're pretending to hit each other sometimes you're gonna actually hit each other uh balor just seems to be super super unlucky because anytime yeah. he's about to get things going Something prevents it. Hopefully, it's not severe enough that it's going to keep him out of action more than, you know, a month or so. And, you know, he'll probably still be able... They can still do promos and stuff. There's still plenty of ways to keep him relevant. Um, I don't... You know, accidents happen. I really don't think this was anything intentional. So, yeah. Yeah, I... um, I'm with you on that one where it's feels wrong to just like crap all over gender for this accidents happen you know it's a it's a very physical sport even though oh the wrestling's fake joke but it's it's super physical at times and sometimes slip-ups like that do happen so it's just unfortunate that it happened to finn i don't think finn is going anywhere or he'll even miss an episode of raw so it's not gonna kill any momentum that balor has Plus, they know he'll be back eventually, right? So they can th use this. Like, don't deny it. Use it as like, I'm a badass guy. I got concussed in the match. I still beat Jinder Mahal. Jinder got beat so bad he went to the opposite brand. Like, you can you can have some fun with this, right? Like, embrace the fact that you can be like an edgy 
badass, not clean cut baby face. Plus, Finn Balor, man, like I still wish I had those abs. But talking about SmackDown Live. So we got at the bottom here, Jinder Mahal and Sin Cara. Thoughts? Because, I mean, Sin Cara has been doing a lot of nothing. I honestly forgot that he was there. Jinder Mahal, man, I really do think he can benefit from this. He was on Talking Smack and wasn't... I expected a little bit more out of him because you could tell... He was they, still in... Yeah, he, he was very, very stiff. Like, just yeah. still in kind of wrestling promo mode. But maybe he said, like, it up. I'm a good wrestler. I'm like the best wrestler to which you could tell. He just like sat down and was like, I'm in the best shape. I'm going to be the best wrestler. Everyone's kind of like, whoa, OK, thanks for that. Now let's kind of, <laughs> you know, we loosen up around here. You know, there's no loosey goosey with gender. He's hard body gender for a reason. Indeed. So we'll just have to wait a little bit to see what happens. there with Sin Cara. Uh, so moving on. Yeah. So moving I don't know. on. The gender thing kind of makes sense, just to not move on for a second. The gender thing makes sense with the whole Mojo Raleigh Gronkowski thing. Yeah. Gender will be a stepping stone for um, Mojo Raleigh, and that's probably where his career will go. Hey, it's better than nothing. You could still yeah, be Kurt I mean, Hawkins. Working so. with a, a celebrity, that's it's getting his name in headlines, so he's doing something right. And who knows, like maybe this does open him up so he's not just a wrestler, because I definitely felt like he was a wrestler in Talking Smack, not a sports entertainer, not a superstar. He needs that personality. Not really there yet, but maybe with Mojo, hey, they can both benefit each other. So then this is this is interesting because we have Rusev and Lana both being moved on to SmackDown Live, but it seems like Lana may actually be wrestling now because she got her own video package, which which I I was happy, uh, happy uh, to see, but then I got so many questions like, is she still going to have the accent? Because otherwise, this gets into like so many different layers. Of if Kofi can drop the end. accent, yeah. then, then they'll figure out a way with Lana. But uh, they are so invested yeah. into it at this, this point. This seems like, is this like Lana Lena or something? Like, it seems like they're just <laughs> recycling what they want to do with Emelina and they're just going to do it with Lana now. But it's pretty cool. I mean, I think Rusev had to get surgery or something. So he's going to be away for a little while. And I like that they're going to try and do something with Lana to kind of separate herself from just being Rusev's manager. I'm not sure if they're going to completely separate them. But it seems like, hey, she's just going to be a part of the women's division now. And it can't go any worse than the last time they tried to put Lana on her own. So it can we can only go <laughs> up, Michael. Yeah, I got to bring up this question because it's super relevant. True Prince asked, since Lana has become Summer Rae, does that mean Summer Rae will become Lana and join back up with Rusev? Like, isn't it's, that crazy? We've kind of gone full circle. Like, history Lana is a flat circle. Summer Rae. <laughs> yep. So very, very interesting situation. I there. will, I will Nobody say. Knows, I mean, Summer Rae, I think, is a part of Raw, but is she, I don't know. Well, will we question. see, will we see Dog Ziggler one more time? <laughs> Please. No, I think we've or gotten the over fish. that. Bring back the fish. Uh, you know, I don't think you want to smell that fish after, uh, like, after. No. It's probably Get a new fish. <laughs> sitting in a landfill somewhere. <laughs> So do you see any possible potential with Rusev? Because Rusev and Bray Wyatt, I feel like, are in that category of they're the big challenge before the main challenge. Does that change? This is a Absolutely. great spot. This is a fan. Like, Rusev is the exact guy you want to move to SmackDown. That guy who just really all he needs is an opportunity. And that's exactly what SmackDown can do. And I think... You can do what you did for for Bray Wyatt. For what happened with Bray Wyatt in The Miz with the first run of SmackDown Live is something that I think can happen for Rusev. I would almost say that Bray Wyatt and Rusev are the opposites of each other in this uh, respect because for Wyatt, all you're probably going to see is him go down. Where this trade with Rusev, he will probably only move up and well, elevate. Well, yeah, and that's what I was saying is... Like what happened with Bray Wyatt in in the Miz while they were on SmackDown yeah. Live, I feel is the same thing that can happen yeah. for Rusev. Plus, Rusev is somebody that was talking smack. He can thrive. He oh, can yeah. thrive on a show like that. So I am pumped. I do love how all of these. It's just how are they going to do in talking smack? That's my real thing. 
Plus, like, it's, Renee it's Young cool. was super sad about it's that. It's cool that SmackDown kind of has one unique thing about it that is it's an interesting element for when someone moves to a show it's like oh how does this factor into it indeed man so then talking about the tag division this is unique because i'll get to the second tag team later the new day so kofi's out of action i think he had, he got like an ankle injury or something he's gonna be out for a little while there's been these rumors about biggie possibly getting a singles push which the man is long overdue i think he has earned it I think that Keith is apparently not convinced based on his uh, face there, which is lovely still. But what do you guys think about the New Day? So we got the New Day, but not all of the New Day. So we got some days. Well, we did get all of the New Day. Well, all yeah, of New but Day Kofi's is out of going right now. To, to SmackDown. It's just they got a video package and Kofi's going to be out for a little while. This is exactly what the the tag division needs on SmackDown is some personality. Like that, the tag division on SmackDown just hasn't really gotten a lot of time. The Usos, you know, these guys are great when when they can talk, but it doesn't seem like they get a lot of time to. But um, the New Day is they'll get time and they will help bring out the personalities of the rest of the tag division because the New Day is oozing with personality. Yes, but does the inclusion of the New Day kind of stifle the rest of the tag division? Because now you've got like the big team there. And you have and then like the thing with the SmackDown tag division, though they don't get a lot of time, there's always those like it's almost like a rotating wheel of different teams between American Alpha, the Ascension. I would want to say the VOD villains, but that's not a thing anymore. But And they were always they were almost like kind of on the same level rotating. But now you've got the New Day over here and then everybody else, because right now you can see the tag team division becoming the New Day and the Usos easily. And those will probably be great matches, but everybody else kind of falls behind them. So does that actually end up hurting the SmackDown tag division in the long run? I don't see how it could be hurt any more than it already was yeah. before. And well, if the you're new not day, building any new teams, then absolutely. If you're turning it into the but new day versus anyone who works Uso with the show. new day and looks like they're on the same playing field, I think is going to get that elevation. The thing is, the SmackDown tag division didn't have a strong anchor during uh, the first before the shakeup. Basically, you know, the Usos you could kind of look at experience-wise as the anchor, but. Because they were kind of a heel team and people people were only just kind of starting to really get invested in them, they, they didn't have that fallback. And the New Day is the perfect team to just come in and anchor that division. They had nothing left to prove on Raw. They'd already worked with everybody. So this is just a, a great spot for them. So any team, whether it's, uh, you know, the Usos or American Alpha or whatever, is going to look better because they're working with the New Day and people are going to be invested because they're working with the New Day. And quickly to Juan's point earlier, don't break up the New Day. I don't, I don't see uh, I don't no, see happening any this year. run. They, it's they happening have a this whole year, new cast of teams to work with. So I don't think it's time yet. Survivor Series. That's my cutoff period. I think that they're not going to break them up. They are going to decide that one of them is going to get a championship opportunity. I see two members of the New Day actually just telling the other one, hey, you need a title shot. You need to become the SmackDown champion. I see that happening. Huh? Not necessarily breaking up. I see it more. I see them. Okay. I see them disbanding as a tag team and forming an, a formal faction. I see them as, hey, we're three friends that get along. That's our champion. That's the guy that we want. Hey, I'd be, I'd even be okay as Kofi. I want they don't any even of them have to, to like, become SmackDown champion. They don't have to change anything other than hey, uh, Biggie's gonna go for the U.S. title, and exactly. you know we'll go for the tag titles, or Biggie's going for the WWE title, and Xavier's gonna go for the U.S. title. Like they can split it up however they want to do it. I don't think they have to formally say anything. It's just they can. Tr they can try and venture outside of the tag division instead of being so like compartmentalized into just being they're the tag team people when they can still be a group that just has two different singles feuds going on or something. And I think yeah. that with the shining stars, it seems like they're getting rid. And, and, and I'm being serious for for a, for a solid second about the shining stars. Now, it seems like they're done with the pamphlets, which great because that never worked. 
it just seems like they're the offspring of the Uso. So I'm wondering what they're going to be doing now because they just seem to be all aggressive and stuff. But Their finisher's cool. With the Powerball. Carlito, Car- Car- Carlito Caribbean cool, though. And I actually do mean that as an actual transition of that could be happening. I mean, hey, like SmackDown could use some more former guys. I, I think we're going to be seeing Shelton Benjamin soon. I think Cody Colley and some people on Twitter like we're going, hey, Shelton's clear to come back now. So I think Maybe we're going to we be seeing some Simon of those faces. D. Dude. Just trying dude, to sneak that I in can't there handle for that. you. I, tr- I can't handle that. So let's just move on to the women's division. How crappy must Tamina feel when even on SmackDown, like she was the butt of the joke from the commissioner. It's like this whole build up to Tamina, knowing that the crowd is going to react to that. So they were fully aware that they were going to be disappointed by Tamina showing up. And then we get uh, Charlotte Flair, which I mean, Charlotte, like it's, it's easy to overlook how much of a superstar she actually looks like. Like when she came out on SmackDown, She doesn't look like a female wrestler. She doesn't look like one of the members of the roster. She is a star, man. And she plays that off so well. And just by showing up on SmackDown, it feels like we got a a big name there. Yeah, she looks the part. She walks the walk and talks the talk. And pretty much just her moving to the women's division on SmackDown makes it feel like a totally fresh new division. And then you just kind of add Tamina to the mix. She wasn't, I don't even know what the hell brand she actually was on. I don't know if they even ever said it. So she's like, she's the other out of thin air pick to just, to just move to SmackDown. Uh, But yeah, I mean, it's, it's like a fresh coat of paint now on, on the whole division. Yeah. Charlotte, is so good for the SmackDown's women's division. I love it because I honestly hope they put the title on Charlotte immediately and then just have like different women taking a crack at her and seeing just like who can finally like get up to her level almost because they put Charlotte on such that high pillar on Raw who's going to rise up to the occasion and finally be able to like take her down on SmackDown. Her presence can elevate the entire division just by herself. And I re- I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with it. Nia Jax versus Charlotte. So we talked about Finn what Balor. What a swan song. Oh. Yeah, man, this is this is tough. Like, even for us as fans, like, we're not in there, right? So people make mistakes. Nia has been under the radar a lot by fans for just how unsafe or... Let's not even get to that part. It's It's almost like the whole... What is Nia? And I think we had a conversation about this like a month ago or so where she's not a powerhouse. She's not a cruiserweight in terms of movement. Like her, Would you say she's uh, she's not like most girls? Yeah, she's not. But the problem is, what is she? That still has not been answered. She's not this threatening force. I mean, yeah, like she pounced Mickey James on Raw and destroyed her a little bit. (laughs) But... The moment that it seems like she did a, a gut buster and then immediately dropped Charlotte, and you could see Nia's face, like, holy crap, I think I just killed Ric Flair's daughter. <laughs> and then it, just in case that wasn't clear, they do the moonsault spot where she was clearly too far off and then didn't move forward. Nia has not been wrestling for even three years. Like, Braun Strowman and her are almost as, are, are almost in the same class between the Performance Center and NXT. I think there's like a couple of months apart there, but... Are you guys are you guys invested in Nia as a character on any of the shows that she's in, or do you still feel like they're trying to have her fit in? It, it's almost like when Becky Lynch first showed up in NXT. I think some people forget. She <laughs> oh didn't my fit god! In. Yeah, like she was doing like, the river dance thing. Yeah, and then she was being overly rated R superstarry with her entrance. Like it wasn't until one of the takeovers where the crowd finally, you know, got to accept her. But before then, it just felt like you were trying to force this person onto the roster. And I kind of feel like that's the case with Nia. I just think the thing with Nia um, is, you know, things happen. I I hadn't noticed her, and maybe I just hadn't noticed it before, but until this match, I hadn't noticed her being so reckless. In this situation, like, she really came off like she was endangering her opponents with how... She was doing her moves and how she handled, uh, you know, top rope moves like basically Charlotte landed completely on her face 
with, you know, with very little break in her fall when she did that moonsault. Um, so, yeah, maybe maybe they're trusting her a little too much with, uh, you know, with the little experience that she has. But, yeah, her image, everything, it doesn't really all add up. It's not consistent. You look at someone like Goldberg who just has... The, his image is just nailed down to everything that he is just all makes sense and it all works. All, you know, every piece of what he does works with every other piece to just create what Goldberg is. Whereas you, Nia Jax, her music doesn't make sense for what she's trying to do. The not like most girls thing, but then you're trying to be this powerhouse so it just all the pieces don't add up and they just kind of contradict each other and it just doesn't all work. It might sound a little bit harsh, but it almost feels like Naya isn't holding up her end of the bargain as far as her character goes, where they've been building her like this monster. This She's always, even if she's not in the, uh, wasn't in like the Raw Women's uh, Championship scene, she was always kind of lurking around the edges. Like when Naya gets her shot, she's going to destroy people. And then once she finally got that shot, well the illusion kind of went away and i think that's kind of the problem that she's having right now and it was very obvious uh on this week's episode of raw like like we mentioned with finn accidents do happen so you know you can't really put naya 100 percent at fault for that and say like oh her career is over because of that but i think she really needs to work on character wise just that image of who like she almost needs to be like a like we used to say, a female Braun Strowman, where she should should just go in and destroy people. But it just that's not working for whatever reason right now. And not even talking, because like even when she speaks, you can tell she's a really nice person. And that yeah. that like sucks, right? Like it's great that she's a nice person. You look at her on social media and you want to hang out with her. Like she seems like a super cool person. But I I want to I want to not like you. Not because of the things that I'm finding to complain about or like the mistakes that are happening. I want to not like you because you're destroying people. Because you're you're an actual a roadblock to like a storyline. Because you're impeding End of the something. Line. End of the line. So I'm just hoping that changes up a little bit. And now talking about the upper card on SmackDown, two people that got moved up, and I am so happy about this, especially with how it happened. So first up, Kevin Owens on SmackDown shows up with a shaved beard, which like we've even said historically, like he probably shouldn't do that. We've seen pictures of him. You know, if you saw him back in Ring of Honor at the early Still days, get a light beard. He's not totally shaved. Yeah, yeah. He's he's like got a, like a five o'clock shadow thing going on. I dug it, though, man. Like there was something about his character, just a slight tweak. It, it's still Kevin Owens, but something was different. And I loved how. It seems like if anybody hasn't listened, uh, check out any podcast where they talk about Sami Zayn. They always say that Sami doesn't shut up. And it seems like that's what they're doing with him. Like even with Kurt Angle on Raw. And then it's like he's always, he's that friend that you love, but you also love to hate. He's like the fourth friend in your party where you're just like, we need to ha- we need to invite him. But man, he talks so much. So he's kind of like me in a way. So I like the fact that he's I'm there. I'm happy you said it. <laughs> <laughs> except, except people like me, Keith. So, okay. oh, oh my gosh, that's fire! No, I, I love you, man. But Sami Zayn, I loved how Kevin Owens is like, I'm on SmackDown, I'm doing this. Oh, and the facial expression just sold the story of when will you go away? Go away. Are you happy he did not go away from Kevin Owens' side? And what you think about Kevin Owens? See, when we first talked about. The like the the first draft that happened, we were saying that they should separate Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn and they decide to keep them on the same show. Now, I actually think it's pretty hilarious that they can't escape each other. So now I feel like they have to stick with this, that no matter what happens, they keep following each other. And they you know, there's that feud is always just kind of there in the background at all times. But I, I love that both of these guys are on SmackDown. I think this is a great move. Once we saw Dean move to Raw, I think it was pretty obvious that Owens was going to be moving to SmackDown. But, you know, these guys can essentially get uh, get to uh, that kind of main player status on SmackDown, which, I mean, Kevin Owens was 
universal champion for most of the year on Raw. But with uh, a lot of other guys getting into the picture on Raw, I think it was a good move for him to go to SmackDown to stay relevant. And Sami Zayn, I think we all wanted him on SmackDown last summer. So this is more than overdue to have him on SmackDown. Sami Zayn on SmackDown is freaking incredible. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Sami Zayn is going to be this year's Miz where he wasn't really doing too much on Raw, but he goes over to SmackDown and just has the best career of his life. And I, the best it's year of his start. career. <laughs> yeah. That triple threat match, man, was, that was, was good. amazing. But Kevin Owens, Kevin Owens isn't staying on SmackDown. I strongly believe that. Just because they threw in that stipulation of, oh, it's not Kevin Owens going to SmackDown. It's the United States Championship that's going to SmackDown. So they, they left that little bit of room where Kevin Owens can go back to Raw. And it it makes... I, I kind of want to see Kevin Owens on Raw because it makes sense with the whole... Like, they just kind of abruptly ended the Samoa Joe, Kevin Owens thing. And um, you mentioned how, oh, maybe the Shield's going to go back together. Triple H might need that third man. Hmm, wonder who that could be, Kevin Owens. And it just makes more sense for him to be on Raw. And then they have the option because Jericho's going to go away soon enough, right? So if they put Jericho on SmackDown, number one, that will be a lot of fun while he's there. But it leaves that room for the United States Championship to almost be vacated. Like we had that number one contendership match at the end of SmackDown where AJ's the contender for the person after that. So have Jericho win, have AJ beat him. Jericho goes away, AJ's United States champion, then you just have like incredible United States championship matches. I don't see Kevin Owens staying. That's that's pretty surprising because you really think that they would gimp SmackDown that hard. Like it, it's already like they got. How is that gimping they got SmackDown? One, okay, they got SmackDown did get one less name, right? They got one one less upper card guy than Raw got. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, that's pretty apparent, but SmackDown's a smaller show and they still have an amazing roster, all that being said. So then you take away Kevin Owens and you give them Chris Jericho, who would be a great addition, but probably isn't going to be sticking around full time, we assume. I just feel like that that is a big blow to SmackDown to do that. And yeah, they do have these interesting rules, but I think they're just kind of putting that in the air so that people, if people ask, hey, what the heck happens if Chris Jericho wins, they kind of know what the consequences are. But, but you I don't think they're Kevin not Owens doing is that. losing that title. They're not doing that for the House of Horrors match. I was going to say, you know, what is their explanation for the WWE title match? What if Bray Wyatt wins? What does we that don't mean? Know, man. That's mm -hmm. the thing. But we don't We know. conveniently don't get an explanation for that. But for to the uh, to like the Jericho blow thing, in my opinion, <laughs> you want to be more specific? <laughs> no, I'm going to leave that there. But All right. SmackDown's best work is when they're building people. If you look at some of the best runs in the SmackDown or in like in SmackDown over the last year, it's people that really came from nothing like the Usos, the Miz and so on and so forth. Bray Wyatt. So if you're taking all of these established stars, putting them on Raw and really just helping that three-hour monstrosity that they have to deal with every week. And then leave this room for people to move upwards on on SmackDown. I think it's really the best scenario. I um, In my opinion, it's easier to wrap your head around it if you start looking at the WWE as almost a three-tiered system. Where uh, SmackDown is almost like the new NXT where if you have a stellar year on SmackDown, eventually you'll get bumped up to Raw on, on the uh, during the shakeup. Because that's plus if talking you, smack helps with that. Exactly. Because if you look at the Raw shakeups or the people that went to Raw, for the most part, it's the people that had an amazing year on SmackDown. So now they're established. Now they're up. They're going up to the red brand. And if you look at the people that moved to SmackDown. Once again, for the most part, it's not a like a like everybody is a part of this. It's people that didn't really have the best year on Raw. Rusev, Sami Zayn, really the New Day as well. After they lost the title, these are all people that kind of fell into a slump, and now uh, they have chance to rebuild I, themselves I, on SmackDown. I don't think it's exactly like that. I I I agree that obviously the people that had good years, they're looking to move to Raw to you know the a show has to have all the best people 
But I, I look at the reason a lot of these people moved to SmackDown is because they had kind of exhausted a lot of their options on Raw. Charlotte had faced everybody. The New Day had faced everybody. Rusev, uh, I, I look at more of... Uh, basically need you know didn't have that great of a year so i think Sami Zayn and rusev definitely apply to that kevin owens i would put more on the he's fought a ton of people on raw he was champion for most of the year so it was time to to freshen things up and i really feel like they do themselves a disservice to put him back on raw where they already have it's it's getting very crowded on raw and i think kevin owens would greatly benefit from being on smackdown and i hope he stays so far he's been awesome on talking smack he needs to be the new talking smack guy after we lost the miz yeah exactly that's what i was gonna say i think that raw and uh smackdown live they need the miz and kevin owens to be on opposite shows because they're the only bad guys that people can boo that people want to cheer, but they remind you exactly why you want to boo them. The Miz was having an awesome year on talking on uh, SmackDown and specifically talking Smack, and they started to cheer him. What happened? They figure out a way to get people to boo him. Kevin Owens was getting cheered during his time with Jericho and all that stuff. What did they do? Man, bash his face, festival of friendship, you boo him. Both shows need that guy because there's not that many of them. Look at Braun Strowman. Like, you get, you deserve a chance for trying to kill a guy, man. But so you need little things yeah, like that. I guess so, but then you're taking that opportunity away from somebody else on SmackDown, you know, because you're you can have the Miz and Kevin Owens over there. Yes, you're going to boo him. But who's going to be that new guy on SmackDown? That's Miz? much more. Who would be your they Miz took three. SmackDown? They took three guys and they moved three. Oh, you know, if you want to look at they took why they took Miz and they took Ambrose and they moved in Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn and Rusev. There's spots for all three of those guys. To be who who who's not getting their due on SmackDown that you think Kevin Owens is taking their spot? That's tough the shining to stars. say. <laughs> That's tough to say right now because we don't know what this new well, SmackDown I mean, Nakamura, looks like. I guess Nakamura cr- crowds up that. But, but even then, scenario. like, um, but we need that guy. Like for me, the the anchor to SmackDown wasn't even AJ Styles. AJ Styles was the main feature. It was the the attraction. He's the headliner. Anchor, yeah, exactly, the headliner. But the miss is the guy that, man, I want to boo that guy because he's so damn good. It's funny at what we're he does. saying all this and John Cena is on this show, but we know he's not going to be around. But yeah, it's just yeah, funny that's to not, think that's not a factor. Yeah. So I guess it's all going to happen really in due time. But overall, so, who yeah. would you say is your favorite overall draft uh, superstar shakeup result? Who do you think? is going to be better because of it. You're excited to watch on a weekly basis, regardless of the rest of the the show, but more so just what they're going to be all about. Sami Zayn by a country mile. It's the most exciting thing that happened in the Superstar Shake-Up. I agree. Sami Zayn was the best move, but just to add someone else to to the list, I think Rusev was another great move as well. Yeah, Rusev is the one for me. I think that Sami Zayn, he's gonna f- he's gonna fit in so well on SmackDown that it's like it's expected. All of us have been saying it. Move on to SmackDown, all your problems are solved. But when you look at Rusev, what do you do with Rusev? Do you just change the character? Because hell, they're changing. They're drastically changing Lana's character. They're changing her to the character that she's sort of been portraying at NXT live events. So you could do whatever with with uh, Rusev. And uh, who would you say is the least? Now, least not as in like, haha, Apollo Crews maybe isn't going to do much, but least as in you think it is a damaging decision that is going to ruin that character. And why is it Bray Wyatt? Because it can't be anybody else. <laughs> it has to be Bray Wyatt. Uh, I already said The Miz, and I, I just think because he was on the cusp of a, a championship run and i think he has no chance in hell of getting that on raw i just love how ultimately the positive stuff is smackdown and then you get moved to you get moved from four horsemen to raw and then basically you got the whole shield brock lesnar what chance do you have Roman Reigns, none. man, he's gonna he's gonna plow through everybody and not only that you have finn balor and he's going Finn to be... balor yeah 
It's, it's going to be a big uh, deal. It's way, way too crowded. And if Goldberg I mean, ever decides to come back, guess what brand he's on? <laughs> You're screwed you at WrestleMania see, season. Sorry, even on I keep the, interrupting. Even on the, uh, no problem. Even on the SmackDown side, it's probably going to be the AJ Styles Shinsuke Nakamura show. Not that there's anything wrong with that, because that's going to be amazing. But and they the may not thing. rush. AJ didn't yeah. move. Yes, that, that was the best move that didn't happen, was AJ yeah. staying on SmackDown. So happy about that. So basically, we have a, a weird pay-per-view happening with Payback. We already kind of touched up on that where we don't know what's really going to happen with the House of Horrors match, apparently. And Horrors, man, I, I, I just cannot say that well. So House of Horrors match. And apparently, WWE doesn't even know what that match is because they've been pulling people. What kind How of weapons should is that? be in there? And they wonder why Bray Wyatt's character is is not what it could be. Yeah. And it's like, I'm going to have this House of Horrors match. I don't even know what it is. We're just going to pull the audience to see what they want. Like He's pulling the uh, fireflies. Just classic. Just classic. Just take him to the Hardy compound and <laughs> figure yeah. it out. So talk about a hard shift. Uh, this, is, this is a really tricky topic, and traditionally... We only slightly bring up things like this, but it's it's blown up so much. And, and I even have a personal aspect to this. And this is regarding the Mauro Ronaldo and JBL story. So for context, anybody that's a wrestling fan, if you've listened to any shoot interview, any documentary, you know that wrestling is a deep and dark place, like with addiction, overdosing. I mean, look at people like Mike Awesome and uh, Chris Canyon, who unfortunately committed suicide. Look at the Chris Benoit situation. Like, wrestling is a dark and scary place that, as somebody that I worked in a small independent company in Puerto Rico, and I got out of it because it was just, it's just a weird world. And in that world, I guess you got to entertain yourself, you know, sometimes with your fellow co-workers. All of us do, like how we do. Like, we poke fun at each other, but ultimately... We know that when a line is about to be crossed, like if I'm wearing a wig and Keith, Keith keeps yelling at me, I am going to draw the line directly <laughs> to him. So I knows. regret none of it. But like, I even felt then, a little bad. Oh, you should have felt bad. <laughs> but <laughs> the, the point of this is that you 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 can you mess around with everybody, right? Like especially with your friends or family. But when it's about coworkers and in wrestling, you always talk about blurring the lines between reality and fiction. As a commentator, what you see on TV is that part of the character? Is it not, or are you justifying it through the character to get your personal point across? Right? Like none of us know this. So what has been happening? Uh, I have a New York Post article here for context because we did get a couple of tweets of people that don't know. So before we get to, uh chatting about this i do want to give this context so newyorkpost.com is the credit for this it begins by saying uh, this part isn't fake referring to wrestling as a whole uh, gbl is an analyst on WWE broadcast where he can be heard tooting his own horn as the longest reigning champion in smackdown history talks a little bit about him Layfield's alleged behind-the-scenes harassment leaked into the public recently when Layfield attacked a fellow broadcaster for missing a SmackDown broadcast. Mauro Ronaldo, who signed with the company in December of 2015, failed to appear at WrestleMania 33 on April 2nd and also missed the following week's SmackDown broadcast. WWE claimed he missed SmackDown because of bad weather that turned out to be false. WWE backtracked and said that Ronaldo was suffering from bipolar disorder allegedly triggered by a Layfield's harassment. Layfield tweeted at Ronaldo, calling him out for missing the event, quoting, I made the show, everyone made the show, everyone. End quote, Layfield tweeted at Ronaldo in the messages that have since then been deleted. Quote, maybe he shouldn't have bashed me if he wasn't going to show up. The alleged public bullying first started in March when Layfield was upset that Ronaldo uh, tweeted about a poll naming Ronaldo as the best announcer by the Wrestling Observer. He he won an award, basically. Uh, Layfield blocked Ronaldo on Twitter and then went on the WWE Network show Bring It to the Table in March, with which, uh, Ryan, I believe you saw that episode, right? Yes, yeah. Yes. And teased Ronaldo about being named the winner. Layfield backpedaled on Twitter recently, said he wishes Ronaldo nothing but the best. His contract, Ronaldo's, ends in August. He has disappeared from the air for context, if you look at Mauro Ronaldo's Twitter, no mention of WWE at all, like no pictures, no reference to that. And apparently, 
uh, he's not going to be showing up until his contract expires later in the year. So this would not be the first time, that's the end of the article, uh, or at least a part of it I want to quote, this would not be the first time that uh, JBL in particular has been brought up for accusations of hazing or bullying. Like we've talked about wrestlers court, right? Where apparently like wrestlers that did uh, questionable things or they, they were blamed for something, they would have wrestlers court and JBL would be involved. Uh, the Miz has talked about stories of being bullied uh, terribly by JBL and being kicked out of locker rooms. Uh, Edge has stories in his book about bullying. The Hardy Boys have stories in their book. So this isn't like a 2017 thing. There are enough stories around that people are basically having this fire JBL movement to which there was a chant on Raw, there was a sign at Raw, and the person got kicked, kicked out. And this is this is spiraling out of control. Like I quoted the New York Post. This is not some blog website from a dedicated wrestling fan. This is getting Yahoo.com coverage, mainstream coverage. And I wanted to get your guys' feedback as like we're watching SmackDown, right? And obviously JBL on SmackDown isn't going to make fun of this or even reference it. But it is a little awkward to see all of this happen. But then JBL is just having this good time regardless of if it's real or not. How do you feel about this? Because it does seem like something is happening and we've heard wrestlers themselves talk about this dark culture of bullying and hazing going on historically, including people like Justin Roberts. Well, the thing is that it, with JBL, he's obviously one of the bigger offenders, right? Uh, but it, it, like, I believe Justin Roberts said in the – he did an AMA on Reddit and basically stated that – Nothing's really going to change because it's part of the culture and Vince McMahon and other people actually embrace it. And it, like you you wonder why during CM Punk's promo when he started to get into the whole anti-bullying campaign, they cut him off is because there's definitely some hypocritical things going on. And even if you fire JBL, it's really not going to do anything. And, I and from what I've seen, they may end up having to fire him just because of all the bad PR that may that may come of it. I at least think that they should do something. Uh, they should even even as hypocritical as it's going to be for Vince McMahon to maybe suspend JBL for essentially bullying Mauro Ronaldo out of the company. Uh, th it. Yeah, I, I, I don't I'm not so sure anything's really gonna like there needs to be a monumental change in locker room philosophy and everything to stop this. Uh, stopping JBL isn't going to stop the entire culture of bullying that goes on backstage at WWE. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky subject. But uh, to, to your first point, Juan, I think you do need to separate the show from real life in this respect. Like if JBL's part of the show you shouldn't be you shouldn't like that shouldn't hamper down the rest of the product because of your personal feelings on him he's just another cog in that wheel and i do think something should happen from it because i mean this internet witch hunt that's currently happening i don't think is the answer i'm never i'm never a fan of this kind of stuff and uh just like jumping on, like basically trashing JBL for stuff that happens behind the scenes, I think is a bad bandwagon to jump on if you're not there yourself. Yeah, it's a little tough when it, that's the thing is I, I'm also not a fan of the like witch hunt type things where, you know, what if a lot of people in WWE, a lot of people who worked at the company wanted to come forward and, and do something about maybe getting JBL suspended or whatever. Uh, that's one thing. But when you have a ton of people on the Internet who aren't there for a lot of these situations and they're trying to basically they're they're championing this thing when they're not they don't know the full story that that's when it's it's kind of an issue. It's, you know, a lot in everyone. A lot of these people really mean well because they want they want to protect the people that they love to watch on TV from you know like jbl it's yeah sure a little hazing there it can be fun but a lot of these stories you read about jbl it's going way 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 too far a lot of just like just mind effing and saying you know telling people to kill themselves every day and stuff like that that's going way way too far 
And yeah, I it's just I don't like I said, I'm not a fan of witch hunts, but I think something should be done. But I think it's going to take a much bigger change, a total change in philosophy. And that's not easy to do for a company, especially when the the guy who's on top, Vince McMahon, embraces this type of culture. But going to an arena and chanting fire Bradshaw isn't the answer. It's something that should happen. Like if it's if it's super serious, you should take these like there should be like HR. But I mean, what do you when things. you show video packages of anti-bullying and you spread this message as a company and then you go and read uh, these stories by JBL? What do you expect your audience to do when this you've been telling them one thing? They find out this is going on. And, you know, that's the message you've been telling them. So they're embracing the message that you've been telling them all along. And not not just that, like, think about think about Roman Reigns, like the Roman Reigns situation. We are we as wrestling fans have one outlet to let our voices be heard in the world of wrestling, whether it's WWE or a 20 person indie show. And that is by chanting, because that is the nature of the business. Like the reason we go, Seamus and Cesaro, da, da, da. And so they're like, yes, man, we got something good. So for the positive, that is what happens. But we have to keep in mind right now that this isn't a behind the scenes thing in a way. Like we've seen some of these uh, things happen on Bring It to the Table. Like this is happening on shows. So this is happening on commentary this is happening on different forums. As a matter of fact, like we've even commented in the past, like why would X and Y commentator be bashing each other when they should be focusing on the show? Like we don't know what's happening backstage, right? But even on the show, I remember questioning myself, what is like, what is, how does that get the, the superstar into like a bigger perspective? And then in my case, and it's a very personal thing, like there is an element of actual mental health data here. This is not a situation of it's Keith is sad, so chant, you know, let's go Keith fire GBL. This is a person that is a mental health advocate. This is a person that has been open about his bipolar disorder, and this is stigmatizing. And like, I'm going to be traveling to Washington, D.C. in a couple of weeks to talk about like children's mental health awareness and all that stuff. So this is something that's very impersonal as somebody that I had three suicidal attempts in my life. Bullying is real. And... It's one thing for me to keep my condition to myself, but if Morrow is being open about this, saying, hey, this is a thing, I have this condition, there's something called reasonable accommodations, which is a federal, a federal requirement, and if WWE is just solving this by saying literally nothing, all those bullying campaigns and a lot of that stuff means a lot of nothing, man, because we're not asking, like, honestly, I don't think the answer is to fire GBL. That solves nothing. Like the issue should not be GBL. The issue should be it's it's the same way. Like let, remove this from wrestling. Let's look at an eighty year old like a white traditional male, and this eighty year old white traditional male grew up at which decade, and maybe he's a racist person. The problem is not the person. The problem is the perspective that that person grew up with, because that person has lived through it. Like that being racist was part of that standard in that time. So it's not to blame the person. Like, I'm not justifying GBL's actions at all. I do think, like, even if it's hypocritical, they should, like, at least in commentary, because what the hell? You already started this, uh, doing this in commentary. At least reference, like, hey, we have fun. Like, sorry. Like, tone it down a little bit. But to just blatantly ignore us and getting it out of hand, like, I quoted the New York Post. I didn't quote, quote, uh, quote a blog, as I said earlier. I think it's plain disrespectful for a company that tries to do a lot of charity stuff because then people start asking. People start asking a lot of questions. And the more silent you are, this is not an issue that's going to go away because I think that unfortunately Justin Roberts uh, maybe has been open about that. But even then, he he was defending, justifying his actions. And in the same tweet, he called Justin Roberts an idiot. So he is publicly doing what people yeah, are just saying making hey, himself you're look doing bad. it exactly and it, so this and is not you know, an internal thing these schools that they go to uh for the be a star campaign and stuff you know these kids uh, kids these days are pretty smart to the internet and everything they're gonna see this stuff and they're gonna ask questions there they're gonna say you guys are against bullying what wh why haven't you done anything about jbl you know and then what do you say then what do you say to them 
And here's here's how you solve it. Like uh, to conclude this, because I know it's a very controversial topic, but how do you solve this? Honestly, Zebra Woods, up, up, down, down. Don't focus on the negatives. Focus on, hey, back in the day, the whole thing was Keith is a brand new wrestler. So I'm going to bully the crap out of him and see like if he survives, like Every podcast interview we ever hear is that, right? Like when I started, I had to like do this and that. I was a young boy. I was this. I was that. So change it by that was then. We're doing things right now. Like up, up, down, down, man. We just play wrestling backstage, uh, wrestling games or just video games backstage and have a good time. Like it takes time, but we are doing things because they are. Because like you hear stories about the roster, like I went back to WWE now and this is a whole different atmosphere. So this is not pointing at WWE saying you haven't changed at all. Because otherwise we wouldn't be seeing so many African-American superstars. Nia is a larger woman who's part of the roster. Like they, they're, it's they gotten way, way better. Company. Exactly. But there's still some old school mentalities from the people that were there before that obviously there needs to be that needs to change. And Dean Ambrose got married. So that's that's something Yay. good. Oh, Dean. Dean. Man, Renee Young has to be very, very sad about this. Like just get just gets married and kind of gets divorced in the process, right? <laughs> well, like, yeah, they that's uh Vince McMahon's greatest wedding gift is you guys get Separation. to go on different brands. And then get teased about it on Talking Smack. Man, she looked so uncomfortable when Ziggler and Kevin Owens brought it up. Uh, but yeah, Renee, don't go on Tumblr. Th- th- there's a lot of hate no. for you over there. Just enjoy life oh, away dang. from that 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 abyss. Yeah, but I mean, that's like a life. That's good life advice, period. Just stay away from that a bit. <laughs> but in all seriousness, congratulations to Dean and Renee. I hope they have a great life together. because they, uh, they deserve happiness. And even little things like this, like, you know, historically we've heard about bad things happening in wrestling. But look at couples that, you know, that are happening because of it. And even Triple H and Stephanie is a success story of couples, like positive things that happen backstage. Focus on positive things to overcome the bad ones and show that progression is real. So, folks, the fan every fiction week, will never be the same. No, never again. But every single week, we ask for your you questions. You don't know what happens in that raw locker room. <laughs> Whoa. I, I ain't even going to get to that. Gender's on SmackDown now. I don't know what gender has to be has to do with that but he hinders people so finn balor man realistically (laughs) i hope we're not having like a one month conversation finn's still out of action i really hope like in two weeks time we can just be like hey finn the finn buddies hey and have a good time anyway getting back to this every single week twitter.com slash bite that cast you can use the hashtag ask me tsn as questions if you want to give us a more detailed question let us know where you are from tell us your life story and give us some feedback about the show and possible things. Because, like, we're just around the corner from episode 200. Send us an email to bitethatcast at gmail.com. So, Keith. Yes. What do we got? All right. Well, our first question this week comes from Brett C. Who asks or says, hey, guys. Hello. Brett from Brisbane, Australia here. There are two things that currently annoy me about the current raw product. And those are, let's kind of go one by one, because he has a question for both. So the first one, where is the universal title? We had a case on SmackDown where Naomi had to drop the title due to a 30-day clause. Yet on Raw, Goldberg didn't have to defend the title until WrestleMania when he won it. Go figure. With Reigns and Strowman back feuding with each other, when will Brock have to defend the title, and who do you think it will be against? So... Was there 30 days between the uh, payback no, and it was, WrestleMania? What, March, March 5th oh. was for... Uh, March 5th was whatever the last pay-per-view was. And then WrestleMania was April 2nd. So I think Goldberg actually just squeezed by there. Yeah, but that being said, the answer of the 30-day rule is they only do that when it's convenient. That is that is the ship that Vince McMahon runs. He's not a world builder. He doesn't like to have consistent rules. 
He just likes to do whatever he wants whenever he feels like it and pretends that's how they've done things all along. Because even if the 30 day rule might have passed the test just barely this time, it will most certainly fail with Brock Lesnar as champion. It's going to be way more than 30 days. I think not this Raw pay-per-view, but the next Raw pay-per-view is when we're likely to see a universal title match. And against who? I would say either Roman Reigns or Finn Balor. Yeah, I think the logical answer is Finn Balor, but I guess they're going to do like a little thing first with Bray Wyatt. But if it's going to be this like gap in between, I don't know, man. Like I honestly just it's fascinating to me how easily you can just take the championship off a show and just not even reference it. Uh, I think that like that's always like the unfortunate thing and why I honestly wasn't happy with the fact that Goldberg was champion and I wasn't happy with the fact that Brock Lesnar was clearly going to win here. But honestly, anybody else like I would like to see Jericho like in some kind of scenario where uh, like I would like to see Jericho get a championship opportunity. I know it seems weird. I'm not going to say win, but I do think it would be cool to see the gift of Jericho, the list of Jericho be rewarded in some kind of like elevated storyline where Brock Lesnar gets put on a list and he has like that type of back and forth with Paul Heyman. I think that would be entertaining and it wouldn't lead to a championship switching hands, but it would extend the inevitable when Finn Balor or Roman Reigns wins. Yeah, for the 30-day uh, clause, I think that's getting thrown out the window. Just don't think about that one too hard. But I don't know. I kind of think it's a good thing that you have all this new talent coming to Raw. Things got shooken up. And now kind of the two biggest, darkest clouds over the Raw product, which are Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns, are kind of out of the picture right now. It gives everybody that just came over a chance to really establish themselves, find their place on Monday nights. And then once like that's kind of all set in stone, then you start working towards the inevitable, which is Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns. It really gives a lot of opportunity to get their footing while not just being overshadowed by that, uh, by that inevitable feud. And I think when Brock does come back, I think it will be against Roman Reigns. We, we might not see a title defense until SummerSlam. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing as long as they can keep if they can keep the storyline strong and um even really put more emphasis on the intercontinental title during that time it uh it can work out to be a good thing basically they need to look back at Brock Lesnar's last reign and do the opposite of that <laughs> and hopefully it goes better this time but on to Brett's second point and that's the tag team division the tag team division is so lopsided with so many face teams. There's the Hardys, Shame Zaro, the other ENC. Who, who, who are the other ENC? Enzo and Cass. Enzo and Cass. All right, gotcha. Rhino and Slater. And the Golden Truth, they still do exist, though they seem to be lost on the house show What's circuit. Up? But on the heel side, the only relevant team is the club. They even lost the other heel team, which was the Shining Stars in the well, shake-up. What about the Revival? That's true. His question is, like gold. which teams are going to turn? I see Enzo and Cass ending also as well, like in the near future. Their whole thing has always been from NXT, we're, we're almost there and you fall short. So I think that's going to be what, what happens. It's easy to look at uh, Shim Zaro, is what you said, right? Shim Zaro is what Shame we're going Zaro. with. Zaro. Yeah, like it's easy to look do, at them do, do. as the there's the tag team that could turn on each other, but Cesaro, it doesn't end up well for him. So then you look at Rhino and Slater, but then like uh how do you see them as a heel tag team? Like I don't see any any of these teams turning as a thing. Like I wouldn't care about them turning because I don't care about them right now. And then the Hardys are the Hardys. You're not turning the Hardys. So what do you have? Yeah, it's a thing. Like Enzo and Cass could definitely make for a good heel team. I mean, they the whole Enzo's whole deal was originally to be a heel. It's just people found him so entertaining that they just loved him. Uh, so maybe that I, I wouldn't be against them turning heel. I'd kind of like to see that. I would have said Sheamus and Cesaro, but they finally seem to be clicking do, do, as do. a babyface team. So 
I, I would say let's not ruin what's starting to to catch on. Yeah, I uh, I agree. I think we're not going to see very many turns. It's going to be more tag teams breaking up because it's very cluttered right now. And you don't really need more heel teams than the Revival and the club because the more the more uh, whatchamacallit heel teams there are, then that there's less emphasis on the tag teams that fall under that. And I would much rather see that emphasis on people like the Revival and the club. So I hope it doesn't happen. We're going to see teams break up, probably uh, Slater and Rhino. The golden truth will be the golden truth, but and probably fade away and classify themselves as obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> and the Hardys will just kind Smooth. of the Hardys. The Hardys will be the Hardys, like you said. I think that the the tag I'm the tag team division is really something that I'm looking forward to see how it plays out and which of the two tag team divisions end up being the better because they're both kind of a mess right now. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Jarrett Q, who asks do you think Rusev will ever elevate to the level of a main event heel? He's got all the chances in the world right now, now that he's on SmackDown. So it seems like when he gets back from, I think he had like shoulder surgery or something. When he gets back, I think it it is time. It is time. It is Rusev time. It depends on what you classify as a, as a main event heel, because Rusev is really funny with his dry humor and all that stuff. So... He can definitely become a main event guy just on that alone, but there's something to like a Miz type of heel where, yeah, you're so damn good at this, but ultimately there's always something about you that I got to end up hating and booing, and that's what I hope happens with him. Otherwise, turn the man baby face, like turn him into a good guy, because if you're not going to go one side, of, one side of the spectrum, just go on the other one, but yes, he needs to be up there. I'm going to be really sad if he's like down at the... I don't know, Apollo Cruz level. Sorry, Apollo, but got no other reference. You're not wrong. Yeah, Rusev is somebody that can benefit from the land of opportunity and uh, really shine in the next year. Will he be a top level? Maybe not like as if you consider top being champion, then no, but he will be a serious contender within the next year. And that's awesome. Rusev deserves it. And like one says, you deserve it. If if it fails, just turn him face and give him a pair of overalls and big Bartholomew can make a comeback. So thank you it's for the question. Get that farm back. Yep. Oh, they got the chickens. The chickens. Goddamn Southpaw's the best. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Cody C. Who asks, who would you like to see Charlotte feud with on SmackDown and why? I'd like to see her feud with pretty much everybody, but uh, obviously a, a straight up one on one. Uh, did they already do Charlotte and Becky? I think they did, right? Back like way during early. like during the weird, basically Game of Thrones of the Women's Revolution, where you had all of the houses going against Team each bad. other. Yeah, so I think it would be interesting to see her feud with Naomi. Uh, obviously, they will eventually revisit. The Becky Lynch feud, um, but those are those two in particular. I'd really like to see. See, for me, I'd love to see Charlotte versus Natalia as a match, but as a storyline, those promos would take like a solid forty minutes to conclude. Uh, those uh. promos would not would not be something I would want to sit through. I would much rather go on the network and watch that NXT match they had than have them relive it. Yeah, because like, I'm all for a match. Just but no what promos. about it? Yeah, because the problem is like Natalia, you turn What's her... Bret Hart doing? Send him out again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but because like the, the issue is that Charlotte is too good as a villain to change, and then Natalia's mediocre at both levels to do anything other than that. So unless like you have Natalia's the neutral entity that Charlotte just destroys. I think it's going to be a good match, but otherwise forgettable story. Yeah, yeah. The, that's the thing with the feud is that when Charlotte or Natalia talk, people want to boo them. Yeah. 
for but they'll have very, a hell of a match for very different reasons they want to boo them <laughs> but uh yeah kind of like what i mentioned earlier i wouldn't rather i would much rather see charlotte feud with the entire smackdown women's division than just one individual woman where she comes in immediately destroys Naomi, gets the title, then it just becomes a rotating thing of who can rise up to the occasion and take her down. Because that's... Let's get Carmella in there. We got to get the big hog involved. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So many jokes. I want to say none of them. <laughs> Snakes. So thank you for the question. Our final question of the show comes from Tibba29. And as he has here, the Nature Boy. Woo! And they say, Ow! "Hey guys, Mama I live in the UK and would love to see WrestleMania in London for once. What do you guys think? Love the show. Well, thank you. See, I was thinking about this. Like, remember how we were going like WrestleMania break and all that, man." I don't know why I was listening to the Giant Bombcast this week and Dan Reichert, which unfortunately I didn't get a chance to see in person, was talking about how New Orleans is awesome. And man, I got the itch. I got the good itch of like maybe I wanted to go to WrestleMania again. And I, I do see WrestleMania, as he said, like as the perfect vacation where you can plan things around it. Right? Like it doesn't just have to be the wrestling part. You can take an extended one. So to me, it would be like, man, as somebody that's never gone to London or Glasgow, or any other part of the uh, places that I've referenced that I should eventually go to, uh -oh. that would be incredible. I would love to go. So London, like I know the time zones is probably why they don't do that type of stuff, although they've done things in Canada. So, you know, why not? But, oh, but no, I would know it. directly north compared to pretty much like a quarter yeah, of the way around the world. Yeah, the time zones. are terrible. It's when you move horizontal is when the time zones become an issue. Yeah, th Look that at how is far the... Toronto and New York are away from each other. You'll realize why that's not even comparable. Yeah. So basically, like, I mean, they were there was like somewhat of an issue even when they did uh, WrestleMania in California, where there was like a three hour difference. The whole all the lighting and everything kind of messed everything up. So. Uh, or time of day, rather. London, I think it would be an awesome... Everything but the time zone is really... It would be fantastic. I think the crowd would be amazing. Uh, some of the best crowds ever are the UK crowds. So a London WrestleMania would be epic. I just think they would... If they wanted to air it live, which would have to happen for WrestleMania, they'd have to air it at like 2 in the afternoon or something like that. And, you know, now that it's a seven-hour show, it may still end up going to like 4 in the morning for people that are there. Um, but the thing is, I think they're very dead set on wanting to do the show on a Sunday night. And there's no way that... I, I know the UK audience is very dedicated, but I don't know if they'd want to... Go to an arena that's going to want to operate from what, like two in the morning till like whatever. It, I, I think that's the issue is that they're very dead set on. We want to start WrestleMania at 7 p.m., uh, not counting the pre-show. We want it to go from 7 p.m. to midnight or whatever. And I don't think they want to get away from that. And that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear uh, from our uh, UK listeners in regards to the NXT takeover that happened in uh, our last last year? Or, no, that was two years ago at this point. And what that experience was, because correct me if I'm wrong, but that takeover happened in like normal North American time. Like there wasn't a special start time for that takeover for us. Was it? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. Well, but even I, I, another question, like Beast in the East, that started in the morning. I know that was in Japan, but us, like, how many people, like, especially the UK uh, watchers, I can't even imagine what, what time that was for them. But to everybody listening, did you get up and watch Beast in the East live, or did you watch it archived or not at all? That's not WrestleMania. No, you know, and I think, but, but and I'm that's, saying, like, and that's as a kind sample. of the point. But, like, that's kind of the point. Like, WrestleMania is the mainstream show, right? How can you expect the mainstream to like tune in at this crazy hour? I think that's why it makes the most sense 
for it to remain on North American soil because it's the best way that they can plot it out, unless it's just this nightmarish experience for the rest of the world. But, like, time stuff aside, I think it'd be cool if the rest of the world got to experience the extravaganza that was... Um, the ultimate that, thrill ride. That was WrestleMania. WrestleMania. And I mean, from a personal experience, I had fun. It was a blast. I'm done. I'm done for a long time. So if the rest of the world wants it, as far as I'm concerned, they can have it. So, so what you're saying, where, you're, you're going to pay somebody for WrestleMania weekend. What's that? You're going to pay somebody's ticket to attend WrestleMania is what you're saying then. Um, over my dead body. I tried, folks. I tried. <laughs> But thanks to everybody for all of your awesome questions. Keep them coming. Remember, we are just 10 episodes away from episode 200. It's a, it's a little insane. We should probably to, start uh, planning about. that, huh? <laughs> we should. Yeah. We should. We got a couple things that are in the works for, for future content, including things related to WrestleMania weekend. Like, we're, we're not done. We're going to be talking about that in a specific video. But for everything that's happening right now, I now leave you with Ryan for the Bite That Weekly Update. All right, so thank you guys for watching another edition of the Bite That Podcast, watching or listening, whatever avenue that you found us on. We thank you for listening to us. If you want to help us grow, help help Bite That become, become more great, the best thing you can do to support us is to, uh, to, to support us on Patreon. But not only that, for things like iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on, even just giving a five-star review or uh, anything like that or subscribing on that app, that helps us show up more on those platforms and helps get the word out. As I mentioned, Patreon is another way to directly support us, and that helps, uh, you know, it helps us basically keep the lights on, do a lot of great things, uh, helps us do giveaways and, and get better equipment, make the show uh, cooler for you guys. Uh, Patreon, we offer, uh, you, you get a raw and uncut video version of the podcast. I always want to say live, but it is a raw and uncut video version of the podcast for as little as a, a dollar a month. You can get some pretty sweet features, so head on over to patreon.com slash bite that for all those details. So we also want to let you guys know that over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash bite that cast, uh, we're going to have a new video up this weekend, which is uh, we're revisiting the BT game shows. We're going to do a new thing. Who's that superstar? Who's that which is uh, Juan's going to show us some silhouettes of uh, pictures of wrestlers, and Keith and I have to guess which one they are. And it's actually a lot trickier than I thought it was going to be. Way so more. if you want, yeah, way more. So if you want to see how that plays out, you'll be able to check that video out on the YouTube channel this coming weekend. So as we mentioned earlier, we're on the road to episode 200. Big, big milestone for the Bite That podcast. So give us some feedback, uh, you know, some favorite things of BT or things that you'd like to see on episode 200. We want to get your feedback so that we can compile that and decide the best way to approach episode 200. And I'm speaking to one listener right now. You know who you are. Don't even suggest it. Oh, come <laughs> on. Uh... Well, hey, that's Keith's words. But yeah, seriously, episode 200, we want it to be a special thing. So if you'd like to see something, let us know. We will definitely consider it. So thank you guys for listening. Let us know what you thought about the Superstar Shake-Up. Certainly things on Raw and SmackDown are going to get a lot more interesting. We thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.